Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Asia Jarneski, UHMC student editor, and this is Jolene Kuaana. I am a UHMC student and a peer mentor at Kaiyao Labs, and we will be moderating this discussion today. Um, so first off, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if anyone has questions, uh, the audience will be able to either ask their own questions or we have index cards and pens near the pizza in which you may write your question and they will be collected and given to us. So it's your choice if you want to ask personally or write down your question. And you can remain anonymous or not, you know, totally up to you. But um, for this section, each candidate will be given a five minute introduction. Um, if you two would like to keep an eye on our timekeeper, Malia, she will give you a one minute warning. So just by the sisters and I to school. I was the only one who went to St. Anthony. We weren't able to afford all four of us. Uh, the other three of my sisters went to Lehigh and Baldwin. I, uh, I went on to the University of Santa Clara where I received a degree in political science. I went on to the University of Hawaii Law School where I got my degree in law. I returned home to Maui, clerked for Judge Como, uh, Richard Como for a year. I went to the prosecutor's office for approximately 15 years. Uh, eight of those years, I was the county prosecutor here. I went on to Honolulu, worked at the first step, worked at the attorney general's office as first deputy, and also was the director of the Department of Public Safety. That department is uh, responsible for the eight prisons and facilities, the 4,000 inmates. At the time, I had around 2,400 employees that worked for me uh, when I was a director. Uh, I came back to Maui in 2005 as a circuit court judge, and I served uh, for almost 17 years uh, in that capacity. Uh, in the year 1999, I received the Distinguished Citizenship Award from the Domestic Violence Violence, uh, from the Men's National Women's Violence. I also uh, started the Montreal Program in 2000. In the year 2000, the program was about 22 years old. In 2001, I was awarded uh, the attorney of the year for the county of Miami at Sydney. I was inducted into my high school hall of fame for the new service. In 2013, I was the first uh, person not from Honolulu to win the Distinguished Alumnus Award from the University of Hawaii Law School, Richardson Law School. Um, and in 2021, I was voted the uh, Judge of the Year for the state of Hawaii. And last week, Friday, the Hawaii State Bar Association awarded me the Golden Gavel Award for uh, contribution to the judiciary in the state of Hawaii. I point those out to you in case you were wondering if I had any experience uh, in being a leader uh, in my quest to be the mayor. Uh, in each of those 
each of the work that I've done, I've managed to become the leader of each of those organizations and have received distinctions uh, in each of those. And that's why I pointed out, not, not to brag, uh, but to point that out. I am also a member of the Royal Order of Kamehameha for the last 22 years, the Men's Halimua Group uh, for longer than that, 25 years. I also sit on the board of the Hui of Akaulua, Double Hull Canoe, and uh, Namheu Kahonu, which is a nonprofit organization that helps uh, young Hawaiian males uh, for leadership. Um, in the past, I've served on, I first was the, a big brother before I started having my own children. And then I switched over to be a board member, Maui United Way. I uh, was PTA uh, member of all three of my children's schools that they attended. Also worked with the uh, Juvenile Justice State Advisory Council, where I was a member for seven years, and also a member of the Violence Against Women's Act group. Uh, so I've got a lot of experience in community service and community work, uh, including being, a, I saw Coach Al back there. I was also the director of the Maui Volleyball Club at one time, uh, both of us. Uh, so I've had a lot of involvement. My wife and I, I mentioned my parents, uh, but my wife is the youngest, sorry, and we have three ch children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Mr. Victorino, you can go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon and aloha to everyone. First of all, I want to thank you, the students, as well as the faculty of the UHMC for allowing us this opportunity to speak to all of you and to engage with our youth. This is so very important because what we do is for your future, and we want to, be, to know that we're working hard to make sure you have a future here in Maui County. I was born and raised on the Big Island, working family. My father was in the military, served in Japan, and came back and got one job at the Hilo Iron Works where he worked 37 years until he retired. My mother was a home, homemaker for many years, also helped my father when we went to Catholic school, and we were very, uh, very poor, but you know, we didn't know the difference back then. You know, we just were working families. I spent many of my summers here with my maternal grandparents, and I saw Maui change from an agricultural plantation um, economy to a hospitality industry uh, driven economy. My four siblings, all three of them still live on the Big Island. I'm the only one that moved away. Came here in 1973, met my lovely wife in 1974, married her in 1976. We have two sons, five grandchildren, and three great grandchildren. And I'm really proud of my grandchildren because one is a teacher and has specialized in. Uh, special needs children. She has her master's in that area uh, and she really loves helping children. And she has a son of her own, my great-grandson that's two years old. So I'm proud of, proud of my Kelsey. Uh, my Kalia and my Kingston are both in school yet. My other grandson who lives out in uh, Honoka uh, in the Pili has uh, two children. My great-granddaughter that's two, uh, three I should say, and my great-grandson who turned one at the end of this month. So I have been very blessed as a family. My service to this community in the work area, I came here in 1973 to open up the Zales Jewelry Store at Ka'ahumano, next to Shirakia. Some of us may remember that, but I think many of you in this room are too young to remember that. And I remember watching Ka'ahumano Shopping Center grow and develop into what it is today. It's unfortunate it's gone the other way lately and box stores are not being utilized very much by you young people because online is the way you shop, right? And that's a different world, that's okay. Uh, I've been proud to serve this community also as a uh, working with McDonald's, worked for them for 12 years, have a degree in hamburgerology. And by the way, I attended MCC when it was MCC and uh, I was honored to go to Hollywood, Florida in 1975 first time the distributive education clubs of America competed in the national competition, placed eight in the nation. I've been honored to serve this community with the Knights of Columbus, uh, a Catholic men's organization that does a lot of charitable work for our, our churches and as well as our schools. Uh, I rose to the rank of senior and supreme warden, the only one from Hawaii who has ever served on the Supreme Council in, in the 57 years that we have been in existence. 
I've been honored to be your county mayor for the last four years, served on the council for 10 years prior to that. And one of my biggest accomplishments and achievements that I've always taken great pride in is serving as the fair director for this county for nine years and doing such wonderful work for our businesses, our nonprofits, and all of our community efforts. This is the biggest community uh, uh, event in the county of Maui, and hopefully next year it will be back. I have been blessed also to have been in this position to make the changes during the most horrific period of time that this county has ever seen. And with that being said, I'm honored to say that Maui is in a good place today, and we are ready to move forward. You know, technology, wellness, healthcare, uh, and uh, agriculture, which, with, which UHMC is a major, and I want to thank uh, Chancellor Hokawana and his staff for all the efforts they put in this area, makes your future a lot brighter. And it's our opportunity right now to make sure we enhance that with the workforce and make sure the housing you need is here for you. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please don't forget that if you have any questions, there are papers and pencils near the pizza. And you may write them down and they will be collected. And you can also include your name and city if you feel you want to do so. If you ladies would like to start with a question, we'll be waiting for okay. your question. So, yeah, I'll oh. go. Oh, we have just a little bit of ground rules for the questions. You two oh. will have uh, two and a half minutes each to answer the question, and Malia will give you a 30 second warning. So just keep an eye on her. <laughs> yeah, would anybody like to ask a question? Hi everybody, my name is Jason Gumball. I reside from Papalui. Um, I originally came from Kihei for like the past 18 years of my life. And I understand that there was implementation set in Kihei for like a new mall, a new entertainment structure. Now this leads to my question to both of you. Is there going to be any more entertainment opportunities here on Maui, such as Ice Palace or a new bowling lane? Or maybe even a new recreational center. I understand there, that there was a new recreational center being brought up by Kihei, by the Pilani School. And I have been there and it was a great center, but just want to know more about the future of like, the entertainment business for our local community here on Maui. Who goes first? Am uh, I Mr. Go Bissett. First? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you for that question. So, um, one of the things I hear the most traveling around Maui, talking to the communities, is how many people want a bowling alley or a new bowling alley. Um, you know, I think we have some commercial space that is vacant. Uh, we can name a few, right? There's the old Sports Authority, the Safeway in Kahului. Uh, there's the old, you know what I think would be ideal is the DMV where the motor vehicles used to be because it's right behind the theaters, right next to that fun factory. Uh, people already go there for entertainment, you know, on a Sunday. That might revitalize that, that area, too. So, um, obviously, I'm not the mayor. I'm not in office, so I don't have any uh, control over what happens now. Uh, but I can tell you that the community wants that. Um, so I would be in favor. And, you know, even if it was something like a Lucky Strike setup where you have a restaurant, I think it's hard for bowling alleys to survive by themselves, which is why we have those that have restaurants and bars and other things are connected with them. Uh, even the one we have left up on Vineyard, that's the only one that's here now, and that's still being used, but very limited. So I think uh, there's a demand. Uh, as far as uh, Dave and Busters, I think those kinds of programs uh, or uh, places would also be what people, millennials, what they would want and would want to take advantage of. So I think we're lacking that here in our county, and I absolutely would be in favor of putting those kinds of programs here. Thank you. And yes, um, there's been long talk about another bowling alley. Uh, and we are working with uh, former Mayor Charmaine Tavares, who has been a real driving force. And there are some plans in working right now for that type of uh, activity. But I think our youth need more than just that. We need entertainment centers where they can go and enjoy themselves. And one of the things we lack 
is any kind of entertainment on the weekend for our youth. Like we used to have dances and get-togethers, and you could socialize. And we don't have that these days. And you know, we need to bring that back. I think that's important because all of us need some time together with our generation or others around our age to enjoy and to talk and to share life. And you know, I, I'd be really uh, looking at something like that in our communities around the county of Maui. The other area is activities that are wholesome and healthy, activities that does things to stimulate the body and the mind. You know, things that are spiritual in nature, you know, and we are working on some of that with some of the people out in uh, Haiku and uh, some other areas in, in this community that want to do something like that for you youth and even us older folks too. You know, our kapuna have been very blessed in Maui, but we got to make sure we continue to take care of them. Well, thank you for that wonderful question, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Aloha, welcome to our campus. <laughs> My question is, how can you, with your capacity, in the mayor's office, in the next administration, build a bridge between our local government and our educational community? We work here on a very small staff. We engage with these students, not just during class for the academia, but we engage and promote culture. We start everything with our own, where we're from, where we move forward. We engage with the choices they could have for careers here on the way. Um, we need help. How will your office, you as uh, the next marriage division, or you as a how will you build that bridge to work with us? And it's not just us at the college level. At the high school level, we get involved with, the, with what the families have to do is to just get their student to class. And we don't do it for the money. We do it for what you will talk about, the next generation. We can't do it by ourselves. Chancellor Hopewana cannot do it by himself. We need the whole community involved. How do we make that happen? Thank you. So who starts this time? Um, yeah, let's go with Mr. Victorino. Okay, thank you. I was hoping you were switching around. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, my dear. You know, um, that's a great question, and I have been, all my four years here as mayor, I have been advocating for the educational system to do the things necessary to make career paths, and what agriculture, the trades, you know. I think Council, uh, Chancellor Hokowana and I have had many discussions and putting the county of Maui has put their money where their mouth is. We funded the programs such as STEM and uh, automo uh, automotive programs and others to help make sure, even the areas of um, uh, band and all of that, we put money to make sure we can continue to expand the opportunities for the young people of Maui County. I, I really believe career paths are important. We're short of, of tradesmen in the unions, uh, in the various trades. We are short in the hospitality. We're short everywhere. And we need to bring back the fact that we have great talent right here in, on Maui and Maui Nui, and we need to make sure those opportunities. Our workforce, our, uh, workforce development program, our, Amer our American um, Job Corps uh, programs, are other entities that help. But we need to connect back with the schools. And I've been proud to say, during the pandemic, we not only connected, we helped our schools with computers, with iPads, with sending out a uh, bus to HANA for uh, Wi-Fi so that the students could have distance learning. We helped the college in many areas, right, Chancellor? We, we stand tall, working together. So we need to bridge that by working. And the mayor has to be engaged with all of them. And that's why, what is the Department of Education, the university system, or any of our educational uh, pods, whether they're Catholic or private schools, we all need to be working to make sure you, the students of Hawaii, our young people, have an opportunity to develop your skills, raise your families, and get livable wages, and of course, build housing for you. I think the one word answer I would use to answer that is build, relate, or is relationships. I think that's how we, build the bridge you're talking about. And the good news is, like Chancellor Hokowana, being a local born and raised here on Maui, he understands 
uh, what our youth go through. And of course, a proud St. Anthony graduate as well. Um, had to work that in there. But I think for us, having to uh, have our youth stay here, we have to have the kinds of jobs that attract people to want to come back and stay here. And so my suggestion is mentoring, building internships. We can't expect to have a workforce if we're not helping to develop that workforce. You know, you go to a company and they say, hey, what can you do? Help me, I don't have any workers. I, the question to them is, what are you doing to help build your workers, your workforce? Any organization that accepts any grant money from the, from the county of Maui will be required to have an internship program in theirs. Even if you're just teaching soft skills, what are soft skills? Getting up in the morning, making your appointments, making your commitments, setting your priorities, budgeting your money, things that you have to do. A lot of you folks are dealing with that now as young students, you're understanding. Nobody wakes you up and says, go to class, do your homework, right? Well, maybe some of you might have help with that, but most of us, you gotta do that on your own. You can learn that through mentoring. You can learn that through internship programs. This school is well known for its nursing and its culinary program, right? That didn't just happen overnight. That didn't just happen by luck. That was focus, because that's all we need. We need people in the restaurant business and we need people doing nursing and healthcare. So for us, it's a focused you know, determination to make workers, people want to come back and stay home. Uh, you folks have great programs already, again, here at the University uh, of Hawaii Maui campus doing, uh, helping in certain areas. I think you guys are doing HVAC. You guys have other programs that you know what the needs are. So we need to do that needs assessment but we as the adults or the, or the business owners need to take a more active role in having internships so when people come home for their summer and their winter breaks, they develop that relationship and know there's a job waiting for them when they come home. Thank you. All right. Any more questions from the audience? Do we okay. have another audience question? Somebody would like to come up? Okay, we're going to start reading off of our questions from the cards. I'll go first with this one. Michelle, go first with this one. I have a question here. Um, you know, being a local, born and raised here, also part Native Hawaiian, um, a lot of my family members have moved away. Um, you know, I remember when we were younger and all my family was here and we would get together and have good times. Now that I'm older, so much of my family has moved away and, you know, there's the saying that has come up, you know, priced out of paradise. And, um, you know, that's concerning and that's what we talk about I'm at home and with my grandma guys. So my question is, you know, what kind of plans do you have in place to put our local and native community first in our community so that they can thrive here and not feel that they are forced to leave so that they can thrive elsewhere. You know, as a boy growing up less than a mile from here uh, in our home where we've been for the last 52 years, um, it never occurred to me that I would not be able to live in the home, the homeland that I was raised in. It never occurred to me. And I didn't think that for my children too. My wife and I, we have children that are between the ages of 26 and 32, three girls. But I worry about that for our youngest, our grandchildren. And that's the whole reason I decided to run for mayor, was because of Lalakia, Naluwahi, and Kilinahi, my three grandsons. Because I don't know what the future is for them. Our platform is called Kama'aina Prosperity. Kama'aina Prosperity, prosperity for all the folks that live here on Maui, through housing, through jobs, through being good stewards of our environment. When we talk about Kama'aina housing, I, I'm gonna answer your question directly. People can't afford to live here because the cost of living is so much higher. When the mayor took office, the homes were in the 700,000s. It's 1.2 million now. Four years later, the average price of a home is now 1.2 million. Who has that? Who has that? We gotta be much more creative. So we have plans for building homes immediately, accessory dwelling units, we call them ohana or cottages built that on your property. In our administration, the first 180 days, we're going to approve 100 permits. How are we going to do that? Because we're going to pre-approve certain floor plans, whether it's a, whether it's a studio, one bedroom, or two bedroom, pre-approve so you can get those built. That's the quickest, fastest, cheapest way to build homes right now. And it's done all across the country. 
It's already approved by the council. We're also going to take advantage of existing infrastructure. What is that? Sears, Sports Authority, the old Kauli Shopping Center, places that have infrastructure but no building anymore, no, no business anymore. We got to build. We got to consider going up. We got to consider going uh, apartment style building. And I don't care if it's leasehold, if it's fee simple, if it's rental. We got to create the inventory. We have no inventory for our folks. And then the cost of living has gone so expensive. Everybody here knows what it costs to put in your gas in your car or buy milk. That's the cost of living. That's separate from your housing bill. So we need to be more creative and have policies in place with the focus of our kama'aina. Not just build affordable housing, you folks. We can stand here all day and take credit for building affordable housing. But who are you selling that house to? If you build 500 new affordable homes and you sell 450 to people who come from the mainland, what have you done for the local community? Nothing. Our program is called Kama in the Housing because the focus is on who's going to live in the house, who's going to buy the house and live in it, not just sell another affordable house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my turn. Thank you. You know, some of the ideas that we've done and produced homes here have started to bring prices down. If you saw the last uh, report, it was under $978,000 uh, home, which is still too high for anyone to afford. However, $1.2 million has been brought down, and we're continuing to work on that. We built 1,100 units. We have 742 right now in the pipeline, uh, work being built right this very moment. You know, when you talk about old infrastructure like Sears and all of that, you got to remember too, now when you go in there, many guys, many of your contractors will tell you it will be more expensive to rebuild or to remodel or to re retrofit that unit than it is to tear it down and build something new. So you got to look at that, and we have been looking at that. We've also been looking at tiny homes and units that people can build in and add to as time goes on. Sorry, I'm talking too fast. You know what we're trying to do is make sure that you, the young people of Maui County, can stay and raise your families here. My great-grandchildren, I want them to have that opportunity. This problem has been around for 60-plus years. And you know, we've made some inroads, but every time we get somewhere, we get an influx of new people wanting to come here. This is the United States. We cannot prohibit people from coming. But our priority is the Kama'aina. And we did that with uh, Waikapu Gardens and others that private developers built for our residents. And today, they're being turned around and sold for substantial profit. I can't, can't fathom that idea, but that is what's happening. But our program is to make sure that some of these lands stay in perpetuity, something like a wine home concept. And also rent to own, lease to own, renting and leasing so you can build your credit so that eventually you can own. Maybe the unit that you're living in or some other unit, you build equity in that unit. So there's many programs that now we are bringing forward. And we have 5,000 units in the pipeline right now that over the next three to five years, my administration will complete for you, the people of Maui County. They are being built for you. Thank you. Thank you. So we actually received two questions about this, but if elected, what are the efforts that are going to be put forth to lower the amount of car crashes currently happening on Maui County? Well, first of all, our police department, I'm gonna give them a lot of credit. They work so hard trying to prevent accidents from happening. We've improved our roadways, and we constantly look for methods of making our roadways safer. A lot of it is responsibility on the individual who travels. You know, too many people are in a hurry to get somewhere, and they, you see them pass you, and by the time you get to the next traffic light, they're right in front of you, right? And that's one of the biggest problems. People are in a hurry. Let's be respectful and understanding that our roadways uh, have been expanded, but how do we build for people wanting to drive fast when we don't have roads for them to? So uh, my, my take is in enhancing our ordinances and laws, making sure that they're stronger, um, also to make sure the police have adequate staffing, and that's something that has been worked on. Every time I look at it, we are short of um, personnel, but we've been working on some incentive retention programs and others that to keep our police here, you know, helping them with housing helping them with a cost of living allowance. You know, these are all the ideas that have been banded about, but now we're bringing it forward to the union and to see what we can do to make sure not only police fire, 
teachers, all of them, all of you need housing. That's one of the biggest costs. But when you're talking on roadways, we've got to make sure our roadways are adequately um, kept in good repair and that we protect people and keep those who are negligent or negligible, stop them from doing what is wrong, drunk driving, in, uh, inattention. We've got all these laws there, but people still seem to disobey them. So when we, when we punish them, we have to punish them with rehabilitation in mind, but make sure they know there's a major consequence when you do something wrong. Thank you. And did you say car crashes? Yes. Okay. Um, so what the county can do directly, so I've spent 32 of my years of my professional life protecting and serving this community. Uh, I understand very much the pain that is felt by a family that gets notified that they've lost someone on the roadways. Uh, so we constantly are evaluating our laws. Are they working? Are they effective? You know, you've seen penalties increase, drunk driving, negligent homicide, what the county can do specifically though, because I've switched from the state, being a state employee now to the, going to the county, is the liquor department, that's a county department, they're responsible for monitoring people's over drinking or over serving at our bars. So we need to be vigilant in our, uh, and make sure that we're properly staffed and properly trained to make sure we can stop it at the source, which is if people are at a bar. Of course, if they're at their homes, that's separate. The other thing we can do is, as the police as mentioned, the police department. We're 100 police positions short, and about 50% short in our, um, our dispatch, right? Our radio transmission officers. So we got to make sure that we, as the leaders of our community, are assisting our chief, our new chief, trying to recruit. Uh, and maybe they're recruiting on your campus right now. Maybe you folks are seeing this, but we need to make sure we're recruiting people who can be in the community. Uh, again, to try to bolster our police department. But oftentimes, by the time the police are involved, the accident has already happened, or the crash has already happened. They're there to clean up the mess and report it. What they can do is when they enforce traffic laws, when they enforce DUIs, when they enforce speeding, when they enforce people, people overtaken on the right-hand side of the road or just being impatient drivers, uh, they still need to have the number of people that can, can handle the work. And again, we're short staffed, so what the, the mayor can do is assist the police chief in that recruitment, retention, uh, and training of our officers. Uh, but again, we have laws in the book. I will agree it's ultimately personal responsibility responsible for people taking action of their, uh, of their personal conduct. But where the courts help is by deterrence and punishment. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I've got a few questions about this topic here. We've got like three of these, so I'm gonna try to condense it. Um, actually, I'll just read this one because it kind of covers these two. I have one from Aaron Green of Kihei. Thanks for putting your name, Aaron. It says, our teachers are so important but the high cost of living here on Maui makes it extremely difficult to recruit and retrain educators. What can the county do to help? Is a cost of living allowance feasible? Feasible. Do I go first this one? Yeah. I can't, I've lost track of who's. You know, when I uh, was younger, I remember there being teachers' cottages, at least on Lanai. Um, I think that's a concept we should consider again, uh, maybe for different reasons. But I think in recruiting, we have to make it possible for people to be able to live here. You, you mentioned cost of living allowance. Uh, housing, of course, is, is a critical piece of that, whether it's nursing, doctors, and or the, uh, uh, the teachers. Uh, and we could probably add police and fire to that as well. So I think we should explore if the county is going to spend money uh, on housing, uh, or if we're going to build, you know, when we talk about these structures, and yeah, it costs some money for, to re, uh, restore some of those places. The, the, the county knows because they tried to offer uh, the county council to, re, uh, to, re, uh, to build uh, housing into the Sears. So, so they understand, they, they agree with the, that concept. But think about if we had it near your campus, right across here. You guys could accommodate teachers that teach here. You guys could, we could accommodate nurses who work at the hospital nearby. You wanna build housing close to where people work. 
So we're not driving across the poly to go from, you know, the up country or this side all the way to the south, you know, to uh, west side or south side. So we want to think about strategically placing our homes. And again, cottages for te your specific question is as the teachers, but this can apply across the board. But if it's teachers, we should consider cottages that I guess that we would lease or rent to them at a reduced rate to allow for them to be able to stay here. Because our middle class is our police, our fire, our health care, our first, our first uh, responders, our trades. Those are the people that make our community work in addition to all of others, but that's a core group. So we need to specifically in that class have housing that, we can, that the county can help with immediately. Thank you. Yes, we've, we've embarked on that already. Uh, Representative McKelvey has introduced and put some money to start building teacher housing in West Maui. And he and I have sat down along with others in the state legislature because here in Maui we have cottages on Molokai and, and Lanai and in Hana. So why not build them in West Maui, South Maui, and other areas abutting or close to our schools? That is exactly what we're working on right now. Giving teachers and our middle class, as we've been mentioned before, fire, police, EMTs, doctors, nurses, medical technicians, all of our middle class that really works hard, along with other working class, an opportunity to have homes and units to live and rent. These are what we're working on right now. It's not something we are talking about, we're doing it. We have, fifth, we have what I said, 5,000 in the pipeline right now. We have 742 being built. Part of that we have not even included is Hawaiian Homes. We are now embarking with Hawaiian Homes with a, with a partnership, like I'm doing with all projects, to build the infrastructure to the project itself. And then they put their infrastructure within their project boundaries. We are doing that with Pulelehua right now and Hawaiian Homes in Honokawai. And what we're doing is we're running the sewer line and the R11 line to the project of Pulelehua, which goes right in front of Hawaiian Homes, and they're able to hook up at no cost. So this will save thousands of dollars for our Hawaiians who deserve and have waited for many decades to get a home. And all of this is being done collaboratively. Knowing relationships, I have it. I work with state, federal, and other entities, nonprofits, and businesses, and I've built good working relationships, and I'm proud to say things are happening and happening now, especially for you young people, but for all of you in Maui County. Thank you. So this question is, how are you planning on addressing the mental health crisis especially in the youth, considering there is no psychiatric ward on Maui currently for people under the age of 18? Excellent question. And we have been negligible in the mental health area for many, many decades. And every time government has slowdowns, guess where they start to cut funding? In the mental health services. Never fails. And you know, Maui County has not been immune to that. And I've made sure that when we had monies, even in uh, uh, all our programs, if you look in our Aloha House and all of these, these are programs that we fund to help those particular areas of abuse and mental health care. You know, Wailuku Town, there's a number of facilities that when I was on a council, we approved, and today are helping out them have a livable place for them to get well, to have that treatment. But really, we have a crucial shortage of mental health workers throughout the nation, the state, and the county. So I've been working with the hospital. We have an idea that we can reopen our Molokini Wing one in a not too distant future so that we can have adolescents stay here and not have to go to Honolulu. But we have to get the mental health uh, workers in there. Right now, Kaiser's mental health workers are on strike. We are, we, I've been talking with them, seeing what we can do as a county to help them. There's areas that I cannot cross because I have very little jurisdiction, but I can advocate, and I'm not afraid to advocate what is right for the people of Maui County, especially our youth. And so I continue to work in this area, and as mayor, I will promise you that this is something that will never go in the back burner. It will always be first and foremost. Thank you. So I uh, started a mental health court here on Maui in 2013. 
I'm very aware of the services that we have and don't have. Uh, the Molokini Ward is an acute care facility. Uh, people stay there up to 10 days. Anything longer than that, they, they get transferred to Honolulu. Honolulu built a brand new uh, state hospital there that it was not being used for a while for whatever the reasons were. Um, while we, it's been pointed out that our health care, our mental health care workers are overstressed, there's, there's more work than they can handle, and of course the pay is now in dispute, and they've been on strike I think six or seven weeks now. You know, regardless of whether we identify a group as being a state, a federal, the fact of the matter is they're Maui residents. These are Maui people. We're right here at a state facility. We're doing this here. This University of Hawaii is a state campus, state run. But you don't see the distinction. There's not a state line and a county line and a federal line. It's all a Maui people. When we talk about teachers, we talk about patients, that's Maui people. They're Maui people first. Who pays for them and who pays for that is secondary. That shouldn't be get us in the way of finding solutions, and get in the way of bringing people together. What leaders do is they bring people together to reach resolution. That's what people want to see. They don't want excuses. They don't want excuses that, oh, it's the state or it's the pandemic and it's somebody else's job. They just want us to get in there and do something about it. Not the no can. Can, right? I mean, if that's the attitude, you know, there's something you got to think about. We find what we look for. As human beings, you find what you look for. If you look for a solution, you find them. If you're not looking, you're not going to find it. So that's the first thing is your attitude. Your attitude has to be that's what we want. That's what we're looking for. So again, with this particular area, there are lots of reasons why it's being underserved. And part of that is because uh, of the funding. Part of that is because we don't have the numbers to justify having our own hospital right here. So of course, we send people to other uh, locations. But I think when, at the end of the day, this, we're talking about our Maui people. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I have about five cards here, and they're kind of are all covering a similar topic. So I'm going to condense them into one. I have a name, one of them from Chad Julian of Napili. Thank you, Chad. And some anonymous. And what they are talking about is sustainability, tourism, and COVID. Um, basically, how you know our island is very dependent on tourism, and um, you know, it, some people feel that it's tourism has become, you know, the one and only thing, and even to the detriment of our people, you know, over tourism. When COVID hit, it says, you know, it was unprecedented. You know, it was a f scary because we're so uh, dependent on either tourism or importing and exporting. So I guess what the people are saying here is, you know, what are your plans for more sustainability coming from within so that when things like COVID happen, you know, we're not 100% dependent on tourism. And even without COVID, it seems like we're so dependent on tourism. Another person here stated how, you know, we're always on drought, we're always on drought, we gotta watch our water, but we know that other are not watching their water and that hurts us as, a, a, you know, it hurts our people. So how can we, maybe deter from tourism a little bit and just be more sustainable for us. So tourism impacts our community in many ways. Um, and it is an economic driver and we, we like it. I, can, I think I can say this fairly comfortable. We like tourism, we don't like tourists. Is that a fair statement? I mean, we like the, we, no, no, and I don't mean that as a mean way. But what I mean to say is we like the funds and the money and the revenue that comes from them. 80% 80, 80 of a dollar comes from tourist dollars in our community. Over half our county's budget comes from revenue from the visitor industry. So we can't neglect that and we can't you know, set it aside. But we have to understand how to manage that. So there's a, there's a plan, you can go look it up. It's called the Maui Nui Destination Plan. They have one for each island, Maui, Molokai, and Lanai, 
2022-2023, it talks about the latest buzzword, regenerative tourism. It used to be ecotourism, used to be sustainable tourism. We just switched the name. It's now regenerative tourism. So when they come here, they learn to plant trees and give back and, and help. Okay, that's great. So specific ideas. What we need to do immediately is charge, or excuse me, change the hours that tourists can drive to Hana. We need to have set times where you cannot go, let's say between the hours of 6 and 9 in the morning, because that's when our residents are trying to come out uh, of, of Hana, right? And that's when things get kind of bad. The second thing we, sh we should think about is putting a toll booth, one at Twin Falls, one up at Tedeschi Winery, going in and out, charging $10 just for non-residents um, to help pay for the impacts that happen. Because we want people to go to Hana, because Hana people want business. They want people to come there and visit and, and, and give money to their, to their businesses, so it's not about that. And by the way, when tourists come, they, they come for different reasons. Some of them that have been here many times, they want to try something new. They want to go into the local communities more. But when tourism was designed in Maui, it was supposed to stay in Kaanapali and Wailea. That was what it was designed to do. That's why those are the resort areas. But the tourists don't stay there. They come out to other places. So it only, it only matters when it impacts the local community. When they come to the beach, no more, no more room on the beach, no more room for parking, uh, or the kayaks are all on the beach, or the, or the windsurf boards are all on the beach. Locals cannot put their stuff down. So sorry I went over. Thank you. And thank you for, you don't have to clap because I can thank him for what I said. You know, all of what you said I have done already. We have limited Saturdays and uh, Sundays and holidays for uh, uh, commercial activities on our beaches. And I we did that the first year I was in office to make sure that you can enjoy the beach on long weekends for you and your family. Secondly, we are, Park Maui is our uh, parking and paid parking for our tourists and free for our residents. Our residents now will have an opportunity, certain hours, the whole parking lot will be for them, and then certain times of the day, they'll have free parking and the tourists will have some parking. So all of what Mr. Bisson is saying, we have already started. A reservation program that we started in Wainapanapa uh, with uh, a former senator, to make sure that tourists knew that you couldn't go to Wainapanapa because it was overbooked. Kind of the same concept they use at Haleakala National Park. We are also making areas where it would be for residents use that the tourists cannot visit, cannot utilize unless certain times of the day. We cannot put tow boats because the federal government will not allow us to do that. And Hana Highway is federally funded along with state money and also Pilani. However, we can put a reservation system and dictate when they can come and how they can come by saying at this time there's no capacity so you cannot come out, just like what they do at Haleakala National Park. These are areas that we have been working on for the last four years. And the Maui Nui plan that he's talked about, our administration worked with MBB, Hawaii Tourism Authority, and the Native Council on Native Hawaiian Advancement to make sure all of this was ready for you, the people of Maui County and the state of Hawaii. We really like our tourists, right? You like your tourists, but you know, the dollars they bring in, but you'd rather them not trampling all over your, um, your beautiful aina. And so we gotta protect our resources. And one of the other areas is making sure the visitors are coming here with ed being educated, being respectful for what they do. And when they come here, how they enjoy. This is our home, this is not a destination. This is not Disneyland or Disney World. We need to protect Maui Nui, and we all have to work together. It doesn't just be with the county, it's all of us, state, federal, county, and there is no definitive line in that area. We all responsible for our Aina, and we need to work together. Thank you. Um, we have a question that I found very interesting personally. What are your plans on reducing the use of vapes and weed products that are flooding Maui's high schools and underage groups? Well, this is where the county, state, and feds have to continue to work together. You know, education is important for our children, but more importantly, we may need to make rules and laws, and they have some now. We've got to continue to strengthen them 
to close down these facilities of vaping and all these things that we know are harmful to you, the youth of Maui, and the state of Hawaii, and the nation in general. So I support that. I've advocated. I've put funding to help these areas uh, to make sure that that comes to fruition. And I hope that you, as parents, one day when you become parents, we reiterate to your children the dangers that are out there. It's not just about government doing it. It's a societal challenge. We, as a society, have to emphasize the importance of good health, holistic health, and all these extracurricular um, items that we put in our body that are not good. We've got to make sure that our children understand it. You know, fentanyl and all this has come out. We need to work hard to protect your well-being. But we as adults have to be uh, good examples also because sometimes we can blame ourselves for not taking the proper action. So I, as mayor, I would make sure that I stand by all of these programs to make sure we keep you safe and healthy. So living in an orderly society requires compromise and sacrifice. That's just the way it is. And we're always constantly balancing individual rights versus uh, what we think is best for society as a whole. We, by our very existence, agree to live by a certain set of rules that is for the benefit of the whole. But you're always going to find individuals that say, well, I don't want to follow that one. And that's why laws uh, sometimes get broken and end up in front of somebody like me. What we have to do is convince people that this is not about taking away something. This is about giving something, giving them health, giving them long life, giving them longevity, not taking away their right to vape. You, when you walk into a room and you just tell somebody something they could do before, you say, well, now you can't do that. They want to know why. They want to know. So we have to do a better job of communicating and educating our people. But vaping, we know, is more dangerous than smoking. At least with smoking, you used to have a filter. Vaping, no more filter. Go straight in the body. And you don't know what people put in those vape solutions. That's how some people illegally take drugs, is through that. So, I mean, I don't have to tell this crowd that, but I need to tell you how, what strategy we're going to use. Thinking strategically, right? How to convince it is to let young people know we are giving you something, not taking something. Because we want you to live a long life and a healthy life. So that's my strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two questions here. And I feel that we semi covered it, but specific and they're specific again about our water drought situation um, so I'll go with this one actually it says will you work to end the use of injection wells for our sewage water to reuse to water dry land and I'll just throw this one because they're very similar. When another drought happens, will there be better solutions than asking locals to stop essential water uses for such watering their crops? Okay, so the first question, the answer is yes. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States of America has already told us we cannot, should not, um, and have no, is not allowed to do that. Now, apparently we're gonna keep trying to ask the EPA or the Department of Health uh, for an exemption so that we can get a permit to do that. But I think we already understand what's best for our lands, what's best for our people, is to no longer use it. Injection wells is old technology. It's, there's so many other ways we can deal with that now. The other part of that is because we create more R1 water than we had needs for. Uh, we have things we can do now, obviously, to store that water and to reuse it and send it to other places. So there's no need for us to do that. And when we talk about droughts, what we should be doing is developing more water sources in places where they are drought prone and places where lots of people live. That makes sense, right? Try to find more water where people are there. One of the problems, it's not a problem, one of the issues we face on Maui is that people live in one place and the water come from another place, right? So we gotta think about where we develop our water sources, not just develop them, but where we're gonna do it. And I think we should have a policy if we're going to be in this together, when there's a drought, 
that affects our residents. We need to talk to our tourist uh, businesses and our hotels and ask them to remind their guests to also be mindful of water use. Even though the job isn't impacting South, or excuse me, West Maui, we should still be asking them to sort of join together, yeah? do something as a group, and also cut back on their water. So I think there are specific things the county can do to no longer inject sewage, treated sewage water into our ground that eventually finds its way to our reefs. And I think there's ways at the county. I also think we should have more catchment water systems in places that we know are gonna have drought. You know, there's a policy, you can't have a catchment and you can't have water, uh, county water at the same time. Well, we can have two separate lines so that we can allow that to happen. You know, when we, when we say, well, we can't do a toll booth because the federal government, you can go, you can, I mean, we've already tried to go to the Supreme Court to change the law. We can change rules. We can change the rules. And we can say we want that there and make an exception. So we just gotta have the will. That's all it is. Thank you. Thank you. You know there's laws that we have to obey and you've been a, a judge and an attorney. And you know, changing rules are not that easy. But then, thank you for that suggestion. But as far as injection wells, we went to the Supreme Court so that we could have a definitive seven-point test for injection wells. Not for exemption, but to make sure we have the H1, uh, the uh, permitting necessary to utilize this water. Out in Lahaina, we have bought and I've developed the Honokahau uh, Honokawai, excuse me, uh, reservoir, which will hold six million gallons a day of water, which we'll use for irrigation and as well as green zones to prevent brush fires in West Maui. In South Maui, we use over 50% of the recycled water right now in our parks and in other facilities. And a line is being built now to get to Wailea so that one day in the not too distant future, 100% of all the water will be utilized in South Maui, reuse reclaimed water, which will also reduce the usage of potable water. Our study by Johnson Controls shows that a number of these um, items will be done, a number of improvements will be done in our system over the next 20 years. We'll, save, we'll be say, passing $73 million savings to you, and we will save 1.7 billion gallons over the next 20 years of potable water, which can be utilized for other places especially up country. And up country, we need to dig wells. They're expensive, but we, the county, have to take action in that area. When we attempted to do that in the past, we were stopped by some people, and we found it very difficult to get it done. And the show me the water bill was a method that many developers got around it because now they could build their own wells and utilize the water. So now we're taking that back. Finally, you know, we share water all over, the, all over this island. And it's really nice that the people from Central Maui have supplied South Maui with water for many, many years. But now we've got to make sure, and we are developing sources in South Maui right now, and we're looking at digging wells there so that they will have their own sources eventually. So all of this is being done. All of what we're talking about has been done over the last four or five years, especially since my administration has come on. But COVID slowed us down, but didn't stop us. And I'm telling you, the future is bright for Maui County. And it's not pie in the sky, it's the reality I talk about. Mahalo. Thank you. Okay. Okay. How, how are you able to work with council members to help implement your vision, seeing as there are nine different personalities in our local legislature? Thank you. It's, oh, sorry, I can't remember who goes first this time. Oh, uh, you? Me? Okay. I, can, I, mean, I was last, last, so must be I first this time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You know, I've really been honored to work with this council. Even though we had disagreements, even though that we have different points of view, we have come together in many areas. You know, relationships is correct. You know, building relationships through the years has really paid off. You know, now we understand each other, we understand the importance, and the bottom line is we're always thinking of the well-being of the people of Maui County. 
And if that's the premise we work on, then we always come to con you know, reasonable conclusions. Is it always the way you want it or the way you want it, the way I want it? No. But many times we find good compromise, and I'm proud to say that over the last uh, three or four years that I've developed these relationships with our council members that are there and have been there for the last four years, it's been a good working relationship. Is it perfect? No. But you don't want a rubber stamp. You don't want a council and a mayor that agrees to everything because then you're going to have challenges. But working together is important. Collaboration, understanding, and respect. Respecting each other's opinion. We agree to agree to disagree, you know. And I've built good working relationships, not only with the council, but with our legislators, the administration in the state, the federal, our federal administrators. I have a great working relationship with Brian Schatz and Kai Kahele. You know, they've, they've done wonders for us through the years, helping federal funding come to Maui. So also Maisie Arono has been really great because she helped us put funding, a couple of million dollars for our new uh, emergency uh, management uh, facility that we're building in, in the Hawaiian Telcom building. So all of this is built relationships and this is what is very important. And the future is bright because I see a lot of good things happening, but we will all continue to work together. And so long as you, whether it's me or the council or any of us, make sure that we're looking for the betterment of Maui Nui and making sure your future and all of our futures are better off I think we are in a good place, and I'm happy to continue being your mayor. Mahalo. So I think it was Bill Clinton that said, unless you control all of the factors, you need to learn how to negotiate. And so negotiation is the key to getting along with other uh, groups that have power that you need to work with. Uh, I have a long proven track record of negotiating, of settling, and of working with others. I, I, I believe the key is to show respect to other people not to uh, impose only your ideas. Uh, I don't think people like if you come at them as a, as a bully or somebody who thinks they know everything or someone who takes credit for everything. I think they want people who have humility. They want people who understand that you need to share uh, the good news and the good things that happen among other people. For me, I would want to have regular meetings with the council members uh, that's not violating Sunshine Law to let them know to maintain a relationship. I would want also regular meetings with our state legislators and of course an open door for federal legislators when they're on island to have them. I want to know all of their staff. I want to know who they are, their names. I want them to be in close contact with my staff so that we can get a hold of them. Not just when we need something, not just when we want something, uh, but also to be of service to them as well. You know, it is about getting along. It is about establishing relationships. It's about giving and taking. Um, and so I think I have a record and a history of doing that, and that's what I bring uh, to the mayor's office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard Bisson and Michael Victorino. Thanks for having us today. Thank you. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you.